Talking is not five after yet. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. It's always a delight to see a full, a full room, uh, in particular for this particular lecture series. And I'd like to welcome you to the 10th annual and 15th speaker of the Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Alumni Series. Uh, my name is Clint Rapphole. I am pleased to let you know I've been here 37 years at the Conrad and Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management at the University of Houston. Uh, they do give you a title when you're semi-retired. It's called Professor Emeritus. And some of you may know what that means and some of you may not, so I'm going to inform you. Uh, the E stands to go. Emeritus deserves to. You put the two together, and what does that give you? Deserves to go. So that's what emeritus means. I would like to thank Wendy Gary for all of her hard work in helping me put this together. She does an outstanding job, and I'm not certain what I would do without her. I would probably fully retire. <laughs> uh, I'd like to also welcome and recognize uh, former Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair lecturers uh, that are present with us today, Mr. Nick Massad, and accompanying him, actually his better half, is Miss, Mrs., Mrs. Massett, Vicki Massett. Uh, Mr. Greg Rocket is also with us. Pleasure to have you here. And our chairperson, Dorothy Nicholson. Are there any other alumni present? I think Dr. Mary Dawson is, of course, and most of you probably know her. And I don't know if Mr. Neal is here or not. There he is over there. Thank you, Mr. Neal. I would, a couple of other things before I turn this over to Dorothy Nicholson. I'd like to remind all of you that at 2 p.m. there's an informal get-together in Barron's where you can meet up close and personal Mr. Bill Fortier, uh, the 1983 graduate who's speaking today, uh, and refreshments will also be served. It's really a wonderful opportunity to find out what he's done since he, he left the, the college and learn more about Hilton and also maybe about Blackstone and all about, all about this merger, that, that merger, actually acquisition, I should say. So we look forward to seeing you all there. And if you could make it, we would really be delighted, and I know he would too. At this time, I would like to turn the program over to Ms. Dorothy Nicholson, uh, the chairperson of Eric's Club. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. My little part here is just to give you a, a little information about endowed chairs. It's something that I certainly didn't know very much about when I was uh, a student here. In fact, it wasn't until in 1982 that the uh, Hilton Foundation granted over $21 million to the college and uh, that money was to be paid over 10 years for facilities such as this building, which did not exist when I was here, and all of the laboratories and classrooms and offices and, and the library and the archives, the funds from that grant and this alumni hall were, uh, were for that, and as well, the funds provided for four endowed chairs. Endowed chairs are um, very prestigious for a college, and we um, have four, that, the four that they established were the Conrad Hilton Endowed Chair, which is held by Dr. Ron Nykiel, the Baron Hilton Endowed Chair, held by Dean Bowen, and the Eric Hilton Endowed Chair, which was formerly held by our Professor Emeritus, Dr. Rapol. Through the years, many other generous supporters of the college have provided funds for prestigious, allow for prestigious endowments that allow the college to recruit and retain top professionals in our field. Some of those others include our development officer, John Schultz, 
and Dr. Stowe Shoemaker, Gianna Abbott, and most recently, the Dr. Clinton Rapol Chair was established and is currently held by Dr. Carl Boger. Now, the importance of, a, of an endowed professorship is that it provides the college to an opportunity to recruit the best in the field to bring you the best education possible. It's very prestigious for a college to have endowed chairs and professorships. The funds it, in, at the University of Houston, one million dollars is the minimum to establish an endowed chair. The funds from these endowments provide for a, a faculty to have uh, an increased salary to provide extra benefits, to provide travel and assistance and graduate uh, assistance. And also it provides funds for events like this, the Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Lecturer. Now, at this time, um, I would like to uh, have Greg Rocket come and introduce our speaker for today. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Rapol, for the privilege to um, introduce a, co a colleague of mine who is very highly regarded, not only at Hilton Hotels Corporation, but in the industry. Not to mention he's a heck of a lot of fun to work with. Uh, when you read Bill's bio here in your program, I think it says a lot about who Bill is. Unassuming, modest, low-key, uh, and it definitely wouldn't be Bill's style to play up the significance that he's had in our industry, in the hotel industry. Uh, but today we're going to ignore modesty a little bit and uh, focus on Bill's achievements and shed some appropriate light on that. And I'd like to use a book by a favorite author of mine named Mar M Malcolm Gladwell. Maybe you've heard of him. He wrote a book in 2000 called The Tipping Point. He's also written a book called Blink, both of which have had a uh, huge impact. Uh, in The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell captured our attention by exploring how ideas and behaviors reach critical mass. Now, Bill left. Marriott International, who I also worked for at one time in my career in 1986 to join Hilton Hotels Corporation. And at that time, Marriott International was the darling of the industry uh, and was really on top of their game. And his boss asked him, Bill, why, why would you leave Marriott now? I mean, we're the darling of the industry on top of our game. And Bill said, well, that could be true, but I'm going to join Hilton and I'm going to build a Hilton Garden Inn across the street from every courtyard by Marriott on the west coast of the United States. <laughs> So, Bill, uh, you, you might think that that was a tipping point for Bill, but in the way that Malcolm Gladwell describes it, not entirely. You see, uh, Bill was one of several Hilton executives that uh, had left Marriott at one time to join Hilton in the early to mid-90s to try and make a difference, to try, try and build Hilton into a better Marriott. In 1999, uh, Hilton Hotels Corporation bought Promise, and it really made a difference. Uh, it made Hilton a different player in the market. You might think that that again was a tipping point, but not entirely in the way that Gladwell says that ideas and behaviors reach critical mass. Uh, Hilton had su successfully consolidated Promise, and using the franchise platform they acquired, they became much more competitive with Marriott and an actual threat. And I can tell you I know that personally, because I was working for Marriott at the time. And in late 1999 or 2000, I uh, actually saw the tipping point when I was in Marriott headquarters at a strategy meeting for development. And it was revealed that Hilton Hotels Corporation was actually passing Marriott in terms of new rooms in the market and taking away the leadership position that Marriott had at the time. So remarkably, quietly, and in an unassuming fashion, <coughs> Hilton was taking over as the new darling of the industry. And that's partly due to the integrity of the great brands that Hilton has, partly an owner franchising, uh, an owner friendly franchising platform, which Bill Fortier helped to develop. Uh, he may not have been the contributor to the tipping point, but he was a major contributor. By the way, Malcolm Gladwell is entertaining 
uh, readers with a new book today called The Outliers, A Story of Success. Uh, he explains that an outlier is a person who doesn't really fit into our normal understanding of achievement. And he focuses on such overachievers such as Bill Gates and the Beatles. Now, Bill may not sit, fit into that same category, but his achievements are inspiration and motivation for not enough for us as alumni and future alumni. So please welcome our outlier and this year's Eric Hilton Distinguished Lecturer, Bill Fortier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rocket. Thank you. Uh, he pretty much said everything I was going to say, so thanks for being here. This is great. No, good morning, everybody. Um, this is really, really cool for me. Um, I've never really done this before, and so I had a lot of questions for Dr. Rapol when he uh, got me introduced into this. Um, so thank you, Dr. Rapol. Dorothy, thank you so much. Nick Massad, Vicki, everybody who was involved in my nomination. I really, truly am honored. Um, I kind of feel like I just won American Idol. <laughs> and uh, you, a lot of you have seen that uh, show. And the judges have to go through hundreds, if not thousands, of contestants before they get down to those final 20, right? And it's those final 20 that are able to do certain things that others can't. And it's kind of three points that I've learned in, in my career that I was going to emphasize with, with kind of what I want to go through here today. But the first is, you know, they recognize very quickly what they're good at. And they try to build on that success. They also aren't afraid to take risks and to try new things. And it seems like those contestants who move up very quickly are able to change and do things differently. And third, they're able to engage not only the audience, but the judges who are so important in those early rounds. Those folks um, have found the success. And it's pretty much the same thing, I think, in dealing in any sort of business, especially the hospitality business. If you can't engage your customers, if you can't engage your employees, you're not going to be as successful as you could be. So my story is not like, unlike American Idol. Thank God I, you're not going to have me sing here. I'm not going to sing here because it, everybody would run out of the room. I'm not a singer. I never want to be a singer. But I have been able to find things that I'm good at and build on those things. I have been able to take risks and try different things. And I'm going to show you or talk about some of those here. And I think I've been pretty good at engaging folks um, that I've been involved with, either as employees or others that work kind of in, in, in conjecture with what I'm trying to do. Because it's very important to get others to help you out in whatever you need to do. But I'm sure starting out in business, I was like this American Idol contestant I'm going to show you right now. Uh, somebody who was pretty sad. <laughs> We're going to sing, I wish we Rain by David Ruffin. Oh, good job. I love that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it, dog. All right. Let's go. Here we go. Here we go. Sunshine, blue skies, please go away. My girl's found another and gone away. With her, with my future, my life is filled with gloom. So day after day, I stay locked up in my room. I know to you, it might sound strange, but I wish it would rain. I wish that it would rain. Thank you. Girl, Thank so you. Badly. Thank you. The dog. Right, right. Daryl, can I ask you a question? Do you and <laughs> your ahead, girlfriend buddy. sing together at home? Oh, on a regular sometime, yeah. Are the police ever called? <laughs> wow, that was bad. And I hope I was never that bad as I was getting started. But it's kind of a little bit of what I felt when I got the letter from Nick Massad saying that I was um, being honored with this award uh, it, into this prestigious club. I, di I didn't really take it seriously. You see, I have not been the best of alumnus. Quite frankly, I really haven't been back to the campus since I left at graduation. And driving in today and staying at the hotel, a lot of things have changed. It's really cool. But um, once I got a chance to talk with Dr. Rapol about what I was going to do here, who I was going to be talking to, and what it was really all about, I was truly honored. And I wanted to make sure that uh, I had a chance to to express some of the things that I feel have contributed to my success. Um, not coming back 
after I realized what, what was going to go on, I kind of felt guilty. Um, even I got a number of invitations to come back for Gourmet Night. And I don't know how many of you have served in Gourmet Night, but Gourmet Night was kind of a turning point for me uh, here at school. You see, uh, I w wasn't really interested in food and beverage, but I had to serve at Gourmet Night. I had to put my time in. And I'll tell you, it was a disaster. I failed at it. I was, mis I was terrible. I was doing the service, and I didn't spill anything on anybody. But the folks at the table would ask me a lot of questions. Hey, tell me about this wine. Tell me about this food. And tell me about the ingredients. I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I tried to make up a couple of things, but that didn't work. They knew more about it than I did. But it did cause me to reflect a bit after, after I got through it. And that was, if I'm not passionate about something I want to get involved in, I really got to stay away from it. Um, food and beverage was not my passion, so I had to find something else that I could rely on, something else that I could build upon to grow. So Dr. Ripoll asked me to come out here, talk about some of the things that have made me successful. And there's a whole bunch of little things out there when you start to think about what am I going to talk about, you have to go through that analysis. And I'd probably, like I've mentioned here uh, before, there's really three principles for me. Figure out what you're good at, build on it. Don't be afraid to take risks and try new things and then learn how to engage others. Dr. Rapol wanted me to talk about from my graduation to where I am today. But in order to know me, I got to back up a little bit because I didn't really have any idea about the hotel and restaurant industry, the hospitality industry. I had eaten at restaurants before and I'd stayed in hotels before, but I didn't know who run, you know, ran the things. There was new soap and shampoo in the room every morning and um, you know, the food was bought for the restaurants. And so I didn't grow up in this sort of industry didn't know anything about it. I grew up in a small town in Northern California. The name of the town was Lodi. It was in the heart of um, wine country, a little bit to the east. Um, and so you'd think I'd have a little bit of knowledge of food and beverage, but I, but I didn't. And I don't know if any of you remember the uh, band Credence Clearwater Revival. They're a little, uh, see, <laughs> anybody who's uh, older, than, uh, older than 40 probably does. They had a song called Stuck in Lodi Again. And um, we like to think that was Lodi, California. There is another Lodi out there. It's Lodi, New Jersey. And I think we're fighting uh, between us as who that song was really about. Um, the other thing in Lodi, I went to Lodi High School. Our mascot was a grape. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the middle of wine country. It's the flame toque grape. We're the Lodi High Flames. And how sad is that? I mean, really. It doesn't give you a good ego when you go out there and the big signs are, squash the grapes. Um, we, we had some trouble with that. Um, but I get to say to folks when I, when I say that is, how many of you can say that your high school mascot can be made into a great little alcoholic beverage? Um, it's tough to do a fermented lion. Um, so apparently growing up in wine country didn't help me to become a food and beverage expert. And the guy in the grape suit didn't help at all. But I did find my way to Houston, and it was actually by accident. My father's a doctor. He was attending a medical convention here in Houston at the Hyatt downtown. Um, at the same time, it was Ed Zod, he, he was telling me about this, the, at the convention was a medical group and then a funeral director's group. In the same hotel, on the same floor, you know, different sides of the wing, and it's very difficult to understand why Hyatt would do that. You know, are you on the life side or the death side? Um, but while my father was there, he'd spent an evening up in the lounge at the top of the Hyatt having drinks with my mother, and a gentleman sat down next to him and just started talking. It was Dr. James Taylor, who at the time was the dean of the hotel school here. And he was telling my father about um, the curriculum, about the industry, and my dad came back from that meeting and said, you know what, this is something I ought to look into. You know, at that time, I was just fooling around doing nothing, um, attending a junior college. So I did. I researched it. Took a look at some of the schools that were there, uh, the different locations, and I used those worldwide academic standards to choose where I wanted to go. Weather and women. <laughs> Growing up in California, I didn't want to have anything to do with the Northeast and the cold and the snow. That was easy. Most of our support network was in California. Didn't have any relatives outside of the state. So I needed to find a place that was friendly. I was thinking Southern hospitality. Well, Houston might have that. You know, the sorority houses might be fun to get to know. Um, so I made my, my decision, sent in my um, application, and was, uh, was accepted. So I was on my way. Um, but I found out very quickly that Southern hospitality has its limits, and it's not as easy to get as I thought. 
I joined a fraternity very quickly and uh, noticed that the president of the fraternity was getting a lot more than his fair share of Southern hospitality. So after two years in that fraternity, I ran for president, and oddly enough, I won. Well, I found out two things with that. Number one, being president of the fraternity doesn't guarantee you Southern hospitality either. <laughs> and being president of the fraternity is very, very hard work. The hardest part about it is you try to get a group of guys that are all about your same age to do things that have no economic interest whatsoever in what you're asking them to do. They can just say, forget it, I don't want to do that. And we had a lot of that. Um, I don't know if they were lazy or just drunk all the time, but it was hard to get them to do work. Well, for an example of this, I had to figure out a way to engage those people, figure out a way to make them want to do something uh, that they normally wouldn't do. And on the side of this fraternity, we had a big wall that faced the street. And it was in bad need of a paint shop. It's hard getting folks uh, to want to do that. But I did find one guy in the fraternity, after talking with a number, that really liked art. He was an art major here. And in talking with a little bit more, I found out he had to do a public art project for, um, for his grade. So I said, look, Pat, if, we, if I can work something out with you, would you build, you know, uh, paint us a fraternity crest on half of this wall? And then on the other half, you can do whatever you want to do, art project-wise, as long as it's not indecent. And it has a little bit of something to do with fraternity life, because I've got to be able to justify it. Well, it worked out. Um, he got huge accolades for the project that he did. For the fraternity, we had this beautiful crest. The wall was painted, and it all worked out. So for me, at that point, engaging others, whether they're employees or whether they're volunteers, finding out something that interests them and helping them get into the, the job, whatever it is, a little piece of that interest is so important. In fact, I didn't even know it at the time, but there's a, a principle these call, days called social intelligence. And that works around that whole idea of finding out what your employees are good at and working with them. Um, by my senior year, I had to fulfill some of my work experience credit. And I started working at the Sheraton in downtown Houston. Well, it wasn't a very good time. The Sheraton, I think, was poorly run. It was poorly managed. The uh, training programs were poor there. The attitude of most of the employees there was poor. And I think the uh, committee realized that hotel was in bad shape. It was having a tough time um, when I was there. And the managers were, that were rotating through were just kind of biding their time until the next assignment. So the attitudes were poor, but I think one of the things I found out in my reviews is that I actually was able to connect with the, uh, the customers. I kept my attitude up, and it helped me realize that in business today, and it's the same way uh, for me today as it was a number of years ago, for, your for the employees that you're working with, attitude is so important. Those folks that have a great attitude, even though they might not be technically as proficient as others, those folks will get promoted before someone that has a very poor attitude, but is 100% technically proficient. Because you don't want someone who's got a poor attitude in your organization. They bring other people down. Even if they're great uh, at some project, they can't manage people. And so as you're going out in the workforce, make sure you keep that attitude up as much as possible. Attitude is key, and I want to show you real quickly. I still got it on here. what I mean by that with this video. I think. Now, with respect, Ian, you're not a superstar, but you may be a singer and a dancer. I am a singer, I'm a dancer, and I am a superstar. You can ask my family, you can ask my friend, you can ask one of my therapists. I am a <laughs> what is that? How many therapists do you have? I have two. Oh, all right, okay. What are you going to say? Gloria. Okay. Ooh. Gloria, you're always on the run now, running after somebody. You're going to get them somehow. I think you got to slow down before you start to blow it. I think you're headed for a breakdown, so be careful not to show it. You really don't remember. Was it something that he said? Are the voices in your head calling Gloria? <laughs> Gloria, don't you think you're falling? If everybody wants you, why isn't anybody calling? You don't have to answer, leave them hanging on the line. Hey, 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 calling Gloria, Gloria, how are you gonna go down? Will you meet okay. him on the main line okay. or will you okay. catch him on the rebound? Will okay. you marry for Okay. 
Randy. Oh, uh, God, dude, I don't even know what to say. Thank you. <laughs> attitude. Attitude is so key. Obviously, this guy's got, I don't know whether it's a good attitude or a bad attitude, but he wasn't going anywhere. He got kicked off real fast. Um, so during my time with Sheraton, it reinforced another point for me. I really didn't want to be in the operations business. So I got a dilemma. I don't want to be in the food and beverage business. I don't want to be in the operations business. I'm here at U of H in the hotel and restaurant management program, and my dad's not going to take me back home until I graduate. I got to figure out something very quickly. Well, what I, what I did figure out was that I really was pretty good with numbers. I liked the finance side of the business. I liked um, a little bit of the real estate side of the business. And so at that point, determined that I've got to really focus here. I've got to figure out the right way to get through this program and learn as much as I can in this part of the business. The other thing that helped me had uh, Dr. Jerry Gall, who was a management professor here, taught a management class, great class, learned a lot from it. And it wasn't so much the day-to-day -day management of people that really intrigued me there, but the idea that as a manager, if you're constantly looking out at the big picture, what's going on in the environment, what's going on around you with the economy, you can make changes in your organization that will benefit those who work for you and with you even before they know it's happening. So that fascinated me, and I wanted to stay in and um, really focus on ways that I could learn to take a look at the big picture. So during my last semester at U of H, I interviewed probably 12 or 13 uh, companies. And you know what? I didn't get one offer. Those companies were food and beverage companies. Those companies were hotel operations companies. And they, they knew it. Uh, they knew it from my interview. My attitude was not great. Uh, my interest, my passion was not there. And they could see that. They didn't want to hire somebody that didn't have that interest and passion. So I got zip, zero, nothing. I had to go back to school. I uh, enrolled in a graduate course here uh, that summer. But luckily, um, Dr. Keister was one of my professors. He knew what I was looking for, even though I didn't really at the time. And he got me uh, into an interview with a company called Panel Kerr Forrester. PKF at that time was a consulting firm specializing in the hospitality industry. They did um, the real estate side of the business. They did um, uh, feasibility studies, appraisals, pro formas. So for somebody who didn't fit into operations, this was the perfect opportunity for me. I interviewed, I did great in the interview, and uh, that summer moved off to Denver to work with the PK off PKF office. But PKF is really a, con uh, it's a consulting firm, but they're really part of uh, an accounting firm. Really dull accounting firm. These guys sat in there crunching numbers all day long, and we had three or four of us that were on the consulting side, and we were trying to have fun. We'd have putting contests down the hallways. Uh, we got people really upset with us. <laughs> but I couldn't work in that kind of stuffy accounting environment. I had to find ways to make work fun. And that stuck with me as well. You've got to find ways to make your work fun, your employees work fun. Otherwise, it's a chore, a chore to go to work, and you're not going to get the attitudes are going to be wrong, number one, and you're not going to get done what you really need to do. So I worked on having fun. Um, my boss at the time was one of the principals at the accounting firm. He, he was primarily bringing in new business for us to do um, uh, the background work for. He left uh, about a, a year and a half into, um, two years into my, my, my employment there. And when he left, I found it upon myself to try something different. Um, I started a newsletter. I started a direct mail campaign to try to fill the gap for his going away and not bringing business in. Well, nobody had ever done that before at the, uh, at the accounting firm. It was either that you were brought in to do that business or you did the work. So I made a real statement with my employers at the time that I, this guy was really willing to do different things, to try to help this business grow. And the reviews that I got because of that were reinforced that, for me, that's what I needed to try to do. And it, it helped me a lot in, at PKF. But three years there were great. But always trying to take a look at the bigger picture, I noticed that things were starting to fall apart in the industry. Um, the real estate side of the business in the Rocky Mountain states where I was consulting uh, was going down. The, the oil boom was over, and things were starting to change quickly. I had made some pretty good contacts at Marriott and at Holiday Inn, Sheraton. They were calling me for information when they'd come looking at a hotel in that region. And so I started talking with those contacts about opportunities 
to move out of this company and into theirs. Well, I had some folks at Marriott that really uh, took an ear to that. At that time, as Greg mentioned, Marriott was um, segmenting the industry below full service. They were coming up with Courtyard by Marriott, Residence Inn by Marriott, Fairfield Inn by Marriott. They needed analysts and folks that could help them develop these hotels. And so after a couple of interviews, I had a great opportunity to move out of Denver and move to Bethesda to go to work for, um, to go to work for Marriott. It was, a, it was it, having that kind of foresight to know when that market was starting to decline really helped me out a lot because right after I left, um, pretty much that PKF office in Denver was uh, closed about a year later because it just wasn't enough business to, to stick around. So Marriott, though, I quickly learned that the guys and gals who got the most respect in the company, at least in the group I worked in, and to, who seemed to be having the most fun were those developers. They were the men and women that were out buying land for Marriott at the time getting it entitled, and then helping to build courtyard, residence, and Fairfield in hotels. Our group would do the feasibility studies for their hotels. And I thought, you know what? That's my goal. I want to be one of those cool developers to be able to have fun and get respect even though you don't deserve it. Um, so I, I had to figure out what they did right. And one of the things that I needed to do was see as many markets as I could, figure out where hotels were supposed to be located, figure out how to get them done. And so I, I I talked to developers as much as possible and started working on those things that I needed to do. And at that time, Marriott wasn't franchising. So you had to get into the, uh, into the operations, the development side of the business if you were going to work. Um, and the other thing I knew that those developers had is they worked well in a team. They were able to work with the brand team, with the legal team, with the design and constructions team to put it all together. Um, one of, the, one of the things, though, that got me, I think, here today, um, beyond uh, my role in business, I had to look back and really think hard. But I think in a lot of these uh, conversations, um, people will say, I have to thank my mom at some point in the down the line. But in this case, it's really true. My mom forced me, almost physically, to take typing. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Because at Marriott, when we started doing our reports, PCs were coming of age. And everybody got their PC, and we had to crank out these feasibility studies um, as fast as we could. And they told us, the typing pool was gone. You guys got to learn, figure out how to do this on your own. Well, most of the folks I was working with were those hunters and peckers. They were doing this. It took them all day long, all week long, to get these uh, feasibility studies out. I was able to get them out pretty quickly. So I got to see more markets than my competitors in that company for these other opportunities. But it was tragic. Here's this skinny little guy who's a junior in high school, insecure, in a room about this size. So you've got 100 girls sitting at typewriters, and you've got two or three guys in the back room just hiding. It was scary. I mean, this, is, this was typewriters. A lot of you don't know typewriters, but <laughs> physical machines. We used carbon paper to make copies. And if you made a mistake, you had to use whiteout, and you had to do it over again. It was tragic. It was depressing. Um, it was a lot like this American Idol contestant. I think I'm going to be very big in my lifetime. People are going to hear my voice and go, I haven't heard anything like that in a long time. You see right through the distorted eyes, you know you have the none. The execution of your mind, you know you have to learn. That is not serious. <laughs> not serious? Is it? Uh oh. Well, that's booming a little loud. <laughs> what a little high. <laughs> Thanks, Mom, for not making me out of, out of touch as that guy clearly is. Um, he needs to learn how to type. Um, so I got to see a lot of markets from 86 to, um, to 89 in the market planning department at Marriott. It was great. Our department, when I started, had 11 people in it. We grew to 31 people. Uh, when I was at Marriott, I uh, moved up from manager to director and then had an opportunity to run my own team as senior director. The things that got me to that 
opportunity to run my own team, being able to work with the team, obviously, being able to get, deal, uh, get your projects done quickly and correctly, and having a good attitude, having a very positive attitude, was what they saw in me and why they wanted me to come out and, and lead this team. And it, uh, the, the team that I got to lead was actually in California. So for me, from Washington, D.C., to go back out to California was very easy. I grew up in California. Most of the folks that were in competition for this job were from the East Coast, and they really didn't want to move. So it was pretty easy for the company to do that. Well, things went very well for about eight months out in California with Marriott. And then the recession hit. This was a pretty big one in 1990. It's kind of similar to what we're hap what's, ha what's happening with the economy today. In 1990, it was the savings and loans that were crashing, creating a huge recession in the U.S. Today, it's banks and it's uh, other financial companies that are crashing. Back then, the savings and loan issue was more of a U.S. problem. Today, what we're going through is more of a world problem. So we're going to be in for, I think, quite a long sort of downturn. Um, but we will come out of it. Um, but we get the call uh, when I'm out there in California. My boss calls me up. He says, Bill, we're laying off people. Um, the department is shrinking. If you want your job, you've got to come back to Bethesda. So after eight months in California, I had to get on a plane and get back to Bethesda. Uh, that wasn't really fun. Um, and the worst part about it is the 31 people that I had been working with, the, the friends I had grown up with for the past six, seven years, many of them were getting laid off. We went from 31 people to eight. It was tragic. Marriott laid off about 1,000 people in a, over a six-month period in 1990. Um, and actually, they were, in, they were in a lot of trouble. If you remember, if you've ever been to Marriott Hotels, everything's Pepsi there. They used to be a Coke uh, company. Pepsi paid Marriott a lot of money to get into their hotels for a very long period of time. But Marriott needed that cash in 1990. Otherwise, they were going to have some real problems. Um, so I survived again. And of course, it's kind of hard to uh, kick somebody out if you're always running around back and forth. Uh, but again, my survival probably was based upon my ability to work with a group, to be able to get projects done, to be willing to move, and to be able to, and to, to do things that, the, uh, that my bosses wanted me to do without a lot of complaining. My attitude was really good. Um, we didn't have a lot of fun at Marriott in that next year. I did get to do a couple of cool things. We went to England to do some courtyard studies when Marriott started rolling courtyard out in England. Got to do a couple of... Um, disaster studies with some of the hotels that were failing and the banks were going to take them back and we tried to work out some some scenarios where we would be able to uh, uh, help the hotels recover. Um, so it wasn't a total loss but it wasn't a lot of fun. Well Marriott's one of those big public companies that has to continue to grow and they got to find ways to do that. They couldn't build hotels anymore, they couldn't take on any more debt so finally they decided to do the one thing they really never wanted to do and that was get into the franchising business. They Asked people in the company, who wants to start franchising with us? Well, at Marriott, franchising was taboo. Not a lot of people wanted to jump into it. I, of course, wanted to be a developer. That was my dream job. This wasn't quite there, but it was close. So I raised my hand very quickly. I said, I'll take that position. So a little bit of going around back and forth, and then it was back to California, back to San Francisco to set up the franchising office, where we were going to franchise Courtyard, Residence Inn, and Fairfield Inn. Well, that's fine if you've got something to follow. But they've never done this before. So I'm out there sitting at my desk. I've got a phone, but I've got nothing else. There's no brochures, no pamphlets, no uh, econ uh, economic studies, nothing to show people why they should franchise with, uh, with Marriott. So it took a, a bit of time, but we finally got things going. Um, uh, and, and by about 1993, I finally started to feel successful. The markets were coming back. I was doing a lot of deals. And at that point, I got a call from the Marriott folks. They said, look, we're going to start developing on our own account. We want you to do it uh, in uh, Northern California. So I'd finally gotten back to my dream position. Um, by taking a number of different steps, I was finally one of those developers that got to have a lot of fun and got more respect than they really deserve. And that was finally me. But um, not too long after that, uh, things really started to change for me. With the franchising side, it was one thing, but the Marriott, Marriott decided, we don't want to franchise in those big cities anymore. We want you to develop corporate properties in those big cities. Well, I had set up this 
great ne network of owners that were going to come in, like Nick Massad, and build right in downtown. But Marriott said no. So I had to tell these folks no, and that was painful. I also lost control of my strategy in, the, um, in those markets because some of the folks that were franchising on the East Coast had political connections within Marriott. And when they wanted to come west, they went to my boss and said, here's what I want to do in this city, in this city, in this city. Well, without telling me, my boss would say, OK. They would come out, and I had no idea what was going on. That didn't sit well either. I was losing control of my destiny, and I was losing control of my territory. Well, it wasn't long after that that I got a call from a headhunter. Hilton was looking for someone to start up development of Hilton Garden Inn in, um, in the West region to build Hilton Garden Inns for the corporate account, to franchise Hilton Garden Inn, and also to franchise and develop Hilton Full Service Hotels. I, I kind of put that call aside for a little bit because I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. At Marriott, they kind of brainwash you. And Greg knows this. Marriott's the best company there ever was, best hotel company, lodging company. You don't want to work for anybody else, otherwise it's a step down. Well, it was sort of true, but um, it was my wife that actually got me uh, to call that headhunter back. She wanted to know what the offer was. Um, she needed a little <laughs> bit more money. <laughs> and so I finally did, and, and actually it was, a, it was the perfect offer. It was a little bit more money. And my wife continues to remind me uh, of that uh, whenever she can, that um, she finally pushed me into something that was right. Um, so on my way out of Marriott, though, I learned a huge lesson. My boss at that time called me aside as I was leaving. He said, Bill, let's go have dinner. I've got to tell you something. He wasn't trying to keep me at Marriott. But what he told me was, Bill, I think I made a mistake. I said, OK, what's that? He said, eight months ago, the head of development for full service hotels came to me and said they wanted to interview me for the full service opportunity <laughs> that was coming up for, for Marriott. And I told them, no. I wanted to keep you doing what you were doing so well in our market. Well, I would have taken that job in a heartbeat. But he didn't give me that opportunity. So I left, and I took a lot of business with me to Marriott. And that has sat with me for a long time. And when I left, I said, I've got two promises. I've got a promise and a pledge. Promise is, I'm going to put a Hilton Garden in wherever there's a courtyard, and I'm going to take a lot of your business. And I've got a pledge that if I ever have an opportunity to manage a team, I'm never going to let a company or my boss or anyone else get in the way of an employee moving up in the company, because that's just the wrong thing to do. <laughs> Even if it's not with the company, if it's with somebody else, and it's a great opportunity, no reason to try to keep them in-house. Let those folks grow. And if you ever had that opportunity, please don't try to hold anybody down, because it will come back to bite you. So I'm off to, um, in the summer of 96, off to Beverly Hills to start with Hilton. But when I got there, I was a bit shocked. As Mary had said, they were a very good hotel company. <laughs> Hilton wasn't very good at that point. It wasn't that they weren't making a lot of money. They were in the gaming business and making tons <laughs> of cash. And that's part of the problem with the gaming business is it's very lucrative. Hilton also had a group of 20, 25 hotels that were very big hotels, very nice hotels, and they did, they did well with them. But they also had a whole group of franchised hotels. They paid no attention to those hotels. They were actually very poorly run. They were bringing down the name of the brand, and nobody really cared. Well, they brought in Steve Bolenbach, um, who used to work for Marriott, to try to change the company. And he had a vision to, to get that company growing on the right track again, and first of which was to take care of the, the franchise, or to take care of the uh, gaming business. Um, but the good thing is, it takes a very long time to destroy a brand. You've really got to work at it hard. Hilton was a great brand, and even though these bad franchises were out there, it was still going to be a good company. Well, while Bolenbach was struggling with those issues, I was out making great headway developing Hilton Garden Inns for, for Hilton. And as Greg mentioned, when I had my first uh, strategy meeting with my team, when I got over there, I held up our strategy book. And it was the Hilton Garden Inn hotel brochure. And it had all the listings of all of their locations. And I put it down on the desk and I said, guys <coughs> and gal, we're going to put a Hilton Garden Inn at every single location where there's a courtyard. Don't worry about anything else. Just go down the list, find us a piece of ground next door. Either we're going to do it, or we're going to find a franchisee to do it. And it was great. It worked, actually, to a certain extent. One thing I didn't know when I got there was there was kind of this little secret club 
uh, on the full service side, the big hotels, they said internally, look, go out and build those things, but don't put a Hilton Garden Inn next to our big full service hotel. Well, I knew that was wrong because at Marriott, we were putting courtyards next to big full service Marriott's and they're doing very well. The Hilton guys didn't want us to do that. One of the things I was able to do was to engage other departments in what our task was and why we needed to be successful with garden and development next to these full service hotels. It took a lot of work, a lot of pain. I had to build a lot of trust, but we were finally able to get it done and it opened up huge markets for us. Um, but engaging and finding ways to, to get other people behind you is a lot like this success of this contestant on American Idol. Why are you here, man? Uh, I really want to make David Hasselhoff cry. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't get that. Why, don't what do you mean, make either. David Hasselhoff cry? Well, uh, when Taylor won this last year, they went to a, this scene of David Hasselhoff and a little tear <laughs> rolled down his cheek. Oh, it was okay. classic. It kind of touched me right here. Yeah, deep. It went deep for you. You're funny. What are you going to say? I'm going to sing Kiss from a Rose by Seal. Well, Great. Hallelujah. There used to be a green tower alone on the sea. You became the light on the dark side of me. Love remains a drug that's the high and not the thrill. But did you know that when it snows, my eyes become alive and the light that you shine can be seen? Baby! Now I compare you to a kiss from a rose on the grave. Oh, the more I get of you, the stranger it feels, yeah. And now that your rose is in bloom, a light hits the gloom on the grave. Woo! Oh. I like you very much. Oh, thank you. Attitude, engagement, Knowing what he does best and doing it, that American Idol contestant went on to the next top 20. So I was able to engage folks at, 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 at Hilton. I got us into those big markets on the west coast of Los Angeles, Hawaii, Seattle, and San Francisco that they didn't want us to go in with Garden Inn, and we were very successful with it. Great Rocket mentioned something that was really transformed Hilton Corporation um, in the year 2000, when Hilton bought Promise Hotels. Right before that, Marriott was the king. They had all the brands, all the right segments, and in the hotel business today, you have to be in every segment if you're gonna be successful. Hilton only had Hilton. We didn't have anything else. Promise brought us Hampton Inn, Embassy Suites, Homewood Suites, and Doubletree Hotels. So with one acquisition, we were on the level playing field with, uh, with Marriott, and that changed the whole company. Didn't matter what else, anything else Bullenbach did before or after that, that was the single most important thing we did um, at the company and it paid off. The hard part about it for me was, at the time, I got uh, promoted from VP of the West to Senior Vice President of Development for all of North America for all these new brands. Well, the Promise brands were great, but Promise was a company in Memphis, Tennessee. Hilton was a company in Beverly Hills. Talk about real cultural differences. These, fo these companies would not have talked to each other um, if, if they were, you know, joined at the hip, the correct way to get things done. So it was very difficult. It took us about six months to get things to where we wanted them to go. Um, and it, there were a number of different things that we did. I'm going to show you here in a second. But um, it took a lot of perseverance. It took a lot of um, cajoling and goal setting and getting to the right, to, to the right place with everybody and understanding what our objectives were. Just to give you an idea, in, um, in 2000, both companies combined did about 216 projects in total together. In two, and that was the, uh, in the last cycle, 2000 was the best year for the industry. In 2007, we did 425 projects as a company. We got aligned. The company worked better with all of these brands than we were separate. And we were able to do that with only, um, 
with only 30% increase in our corporate staff. Th um, three goals and uh, objectives that I think led us to uh, key success factors in getting all that done. First, our goals were clear. Number one, we were going to beat Marriott. Every deal that we were going to do we were, was going to count, and we were going to go after every deal like we were second. I broke the team, this vast network, we had 20-some uh, developers at the time, I broke them into regional teams. Those regional teams, we pushed the decision-making out of the corporate office down into the field as much as possible. I wasn't going to make the mistake that Marriott made with me, and that is having corporate decide what deals were going to get done or not before they even got uh, to the corporate, uh, to the regional level. The guys uh, uh, and the gals in the regional teams were charged to do good deals, do the right deals, and take care of the customer. And for us, the customer wasn't the guest. For us, the customer is that developer, he or she, that's building the hotel. That was who we lived for every day, was that customer. And reinforced every day and every opportunity that the customer was the most important person. When that customer called, we got a call back within a couple of hours or that very next morning. When that customer needed us to come out to a site to take a look at uh, an opportunity they had or a conversion opportunity to take a look at a hotel, we got, that, we got out there within a day or two. We also set up an organization where we could have flexibility with that customer to work with the brand team, to work with the design and construction team to get a deal done. It wasn't our way or the highway. It was let's find a way to make it work for everybody. And that really paid off. This year, I was rewarded for my efforts. I um, was promoted to Senior Vice President of the Americas. So not just um, North America franchising, but now I've got all development for North America and South America for all of our brands. It's an incredible opportunity, and it's very exciting. And in addition to that, I'm also working with our brand team to develop two new brands for Hilton. Um, it's, uh, the first one is an extended stay product that will sit underneath Homewood Suites. At Homewood, the average rate's about $130. This new brand is going to have an ADR of about $100. We're missing those customers today because they can't afford the products. And I think for this time in our cycle, it's going to be perfect. The other brand that we're going after is we don't have a hip lifestyle brand. We have Conrad Hotels and Waldorf Hotels, but not something to compete with W. So we're designing a brand to do that. And that brand will be launched in March at the Berlin Hotel Show. So it's going to be fun. So it's been a great run. And it's reinforced really the three things for me that I think are most important. Number one, find something you're good at and continue working on it. I'm not good at food and beverage. I'm not good at running hotels. But I think I'm pretty good at the real estate side of the business. And I'm going to stay focused on that. The other thing is don't be afraid to take risks. I moved five times with Marriott, back and forth, to get new opportunities. My dream job was that development job. And I had to take something that most of my peers at Marriott said I shouldn't do, and that was get into the franchising business. They thought that was a mistake at the time, but actually it was exactly what I needed to do. And third and finally, make sure you engage those others that you're working with, those other constituents in the company. They have to trust you. You have to be able to trust them. And if there's not that trust and respect, you're going to find it very, very hard to get along in those companies. It's really a process very similar to our folks at American Idol. Uh, so what you singing, man? I'll be singing Always On My Mind. Thank All right, go for it, man. Maybe I didn't love you quite as often as I could have. Maybe I didn't treat you quite as good as I should have. If I made you feel second best, I'm so sorry I was blind. Oh, yeah, you were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. All right. Oh, oh. yeah. Mm. Lovely. Talk about engagement. What are you going to say? <laughs> I'm going to sing I Wish It Would Rain by David oh. Ruffin. Oh, good <laughs> They're back.
Holy cow. We don't want to do that one again. That was horrible. Thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I've been able to share something with you that will stick. And uh, you'll be able to be as successful as I have been in this business. Thank you all again. Five minutes for questions. Anybody want to sing? <laughs> uh, uh, back here first, I think. Well, being good with numbers, um, I actually did pretty well in accounting and did pretty well in the finance side. And um, really getting into the development piece was, um, I really found that when I went to work for PKF. Because there it was all about um, grinding out the numbers, supply numbers, demand numbers, uh, doing pro formas for hotels. <coughs> and I really got involved and really liked doing that. It wasn't a chore for me to run through a pro forma of you know, 15 different numbers and do some analysis upside, downside. I thought it was pretty cool. And I was learning a lot about how to finance hotels, how to get that stuff done. So for me, it was very clear um, that the, the real estate side, the finance side, was much more where I belonged than the operations side. How has the acquisition by Blackstone affected you? Right now, it hasn't affected us too much. Um, Blackstone's a good company. Blackstone um, it probably has a bad reputation in the media and with a lot of people. They think they're big corporate raiders. They go out and you know, just destroy a company, take it apart for their profit. Well, Blackstone's very good at real estate. Blackstone's very good at finance. They're not good at operations. They don't know a thing about branding hotels. So they've relied on us to tell them what's really going to work. And, and we want to work within their systems. We want to try to make them more money. But they've been very cautious not to fool with the model that's been so good. Very good example of that. Blackstone also owns La Quinta. They came to us early on and said, can we make La Quinta part of the Hilton family? We thought, oh god, here we go. Um, we spent about a week and a half with the La Quinta folks and a team that we had put together um, to see if that um, integration could work. We knew within about a day and a half that it wasn't going to work. But we put all the numbers together, we put all the analysis together, and had a big meeting with uh, the Blackstone team. This was John Gray and John Cirelli, the guys that are running that side of the business. And they looked at our numbers, they listened to our uh, analysis, and they said, you know what, we agree with you. It would have created a, a huge value, incremental increase in value, if La Quinta would have been part of the Hilton family. But they didn't push us on it, because we showed them why it wouldn't work, and why it wouldn't be good for Hilton family to take on this sort of stepchild. A good question. <laughs> yep. You're talking about uh, Blackstone not being good operators. I understand uh, my executive chef and food and beverage manager just went to Chicago for a food and beverage consortium meeting. Um, they're making a lot of recommendations that don't make sense. Uh, there's a lot of IT. If we take this away, but there's nothing to suggest to put something in there. All the way in food and beverage. Do you have any idea? Um, but that's not necessarily Blackstone doing that. I know that we're looking at a lot of things. Like I said, um, we're running into a cycle here where things are going to be very slow for the hotel business. Um, we have to find ways for our owners to be able to continue to make money uh, in the business. Blackstone and, and other owners, other partners that we have. They're trying a whole bunch of different things to reduce cost, but believe me, the, uh, we have SALT scores, we have customer satisfaction scores. Those scores have to remain where they are. We're not going to let those scores slip. So if we try something different and those scores slip, we'll have to fix it. Um, but there's no reason not to try something new and see if we can make it happen. Um, but they're not so much forcing that on us as our own executive committee, which is Chris Nacetta, um, Ian Carter and the other guys that know the hotel side of the business, just trying different things to save money. Yep. Well, um, at Berlin, we're going to do the lifestyle. At Alice, which is, and I probably forgot to mention that, um, in January in, uh, next year, we're going to introduce the uh, new extended stay concept. So leading up to that, we've got to get the uh, disclosure documents done. We've got to get the promotional materials. We've got to get the design materials so the developers know what to build. We've got to put the operations manuals together. So all of that's taking place now for both of those concepts. Once we release it, 
it's kind of you jump and you try to grab a hold of all those developers, all those opportunities that you can to bring them in to see if they'll make it fit. So then it's really execution. We gotta, <coughs> we've got to find developers, owners that want this brand. We've, we're kind of out there teasing folks. I mean, Nick and Vicky know what's going on with this extended stay brand. Um, some of our developers have already told us they want to get involved in it. We just don't have anything to show them yet, but we will within a few weeks. Once we do, then it becomes a sales process to go knock on their doors. Here's what we're doing. You've expressed some interest. Here's the package. Is this something you would actually really like to go after and build? And then once they're built, you've got to support them, make sure that the owners are running them correctly, that our systems of reservation, the technology, group sales all work to fill those hotels. That's really the next spot. One more question. Yes. Yep, yep, was here last night, be here tonight. Hopefully, um, I mean, it's a, it's a great location, obviously you can come down here and do this, but I had a great opportunity this year to work with Dean Bowen and others on the campus. Um, uh, the Conrad Foundation is gonna put a six and a half million dollars into the property. The university's gonna put some money into the property. This new, this hotel, when we get it redone, is gonna be really cool. Uh, one of the things we're doing on the, the Hilton side, we're gonna try a lot of different sort of boutique-ish type of things in those rooms, in design, in technology. Um, you're gonna be real proud of this hotel once that rehab is done. How are the ratings now? <laughs> uh, oh, we're out of questions. Sorry, you said that was the last one. <laughs> are there any, uh, just may I ask you that any advice for the students in this economic downturn, what they should be thinking about? Um, yeah. It's, it, don't get depressed. I mean, I think it's going to be a pretty good downturn. It's hard not to think about um, your, you know, your career, what are you going to do. Some of you are going to be graduating this year, going to be getting into an environment that's very, very difficult. My advice is, and I've been through a couple of these, just get started somewhere, wherever it is, uh, food and beverage, accounting firm, um, anybody that's got a piece of this industry, find your way in, get in, learn as much as you can, produce the attitude, try different things. Um, try out your style of business, whether it's managing people, whether it's managing customers. Just try new things. Get accustomed to it because that's what an, your next employer is going to be looking for. Not only your, um, your work experience, but your attitude, your story, what you've been able to accomplish, and whether it's just being a bartender, um, uh, you know, working at the front desk at some hotel. It might not be a management position, but you can make it into that. And even that starting at that one little spot. Um, might turn into, um, you know, um, an empire like Nick and Vicky have, where they started with just one little hotel managing it, and now they've got a very large number of hotels, and they're one of our best franchisees in our system. Um, so starting out small is not a bad thing. Uh, it's just what you make of it after that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have a couple more things. I'd like Mr. Masson to come up. He has something he'd like to, to say. Next. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Hi. I'm Nick. Um, I'm a 73 graduate, and I um, do have a hotel company here in town, and we deal with a lot of different brands, and I can tell you that Hilton is a joy to work with. Uh, from an owner perspective, as a franchisee, they're a joy to work with. Uh, they're on your side of the table. Uh, I can't say enough about the company, and I think it's the way it is because of people like Bill Fortier, and particularly Bill. Uh, and he has that can-do spirit uh, that's right here in this room, and each of you can follow in his footsteps. But I just had one little uh, message that I wanted to read to Bill that came in yesterday, was emailed to me. Bill. Uh, congratulations on your honor of being inducted into the Eric's Club at Hilton College. We are very proud of you and hope that you have a great experience over the next two days. Christopher Nacetta, President and CEO of Hilton Hotel Corporation. Oh. I told him I was out doing a hotel deal. Who told him I was here? Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, just be patient, folks. We just have a. We always 
like to give out other things. That was a very unexpected and a very appropriate award. We also have a plaque we'd like to give to you. It says the Conrad and Hilton College, University of Houston, William B. Fortier or Fortier? Fortier. I'm, uh, Eric I'm schizophrenic. Eric Hilton, Chair, Alumni Series, November 20th, 2008, signed by Dean John Bowen and, and yours truly. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to move over here. Move over here. Move over here. Don't look. Don't look. You used a word. You used a word in your presentation. Yes. And that word was trust. Ah, yes. <laughs> I don't, do I have to fall backwards or anything? Well, we, we were going to ask you to do something very shortly, but uh, move backwards. Doesn't involve singing, does it? <laughs> Now, how much do you trust me? <laughs> well, would, would you I, sit down, please? <laughs> don't look down, but just sit down. Uh, <laughs> this is this nice. This is a chair that you will be receiving the Eric Hilton Distinguished. Oh, Club very cool. Chair. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. I, I don't know how I'm going to get it in the overhead in the plane, but <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? You're, you're welcome to come up and chat with him if you'd like. Uh, we have a few more minutes, uh, but we also have some pictures that we'll be taking. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir.